Today's tale begins April 24th, 1965. The setting? Greenwood Cemetery in Hot Springs, Arkansas. One imagines the scene as the town come to pay their respects to one of the good guys. Owen Vincent Madden had arrived in the town in 1936 in an effort to turn his poor health around in their famed healing waters. A wealthy businessman from Leeds, England, by way of New York, only fell in love with the relaxed pace of life in Hot Springs. Somewhere, the charming middle-aged bachelor fell for Agnes Demby, the 34-year-old shop clerk and daughter of the postmaster. Though certain rumours persisted about the man, he soon became a pillar of the community. Only Madden passed away of emphysema, aged 73, and many a gangster and civilian alike would mourn his passing. I've seen it written in the weeks following his funeral. The people of Hot Springs would be surprised and horrified at news of the monster who walks among them. I've no doubt some were, but we are talking about Hot Springs, a then corrupt town, a known safe haven for gangsters on the lam. It was the place where US attorney Thomas Dewey finally handcuffed the legendary mob boss Lucky Luciano. When he couldn't do him for multiple acts of murder, Dewey got Luciano for his part ownership of a brothel. I believe a lot of locals were aware of his past, and it would be naive to either say Oni pulled the wool over all of their eyes, or that in some form or other he didn't have some racket going there. But naive as this is going to sound, I also believe that he was a much better man in his later years than he had been when in New York. So who was this man? And what was this mysterious past which may have shocked some people in the community? Owen Vincent Madden was born in Leeds, England, on December 18, 1891, to an Irish family. The Maddens emigrated to New York in 1902, settling in the tough Irish-American neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan. With an overabundance of street gangs in the neighborhood, it was no surprise that by age 11, Madden was a member of a group known as the Gotha Gang, and even at this young age, Madden was known to be a handful. As he reached his teens, Madden ascended through the ranks, but nearly found his career derailed in his late teens. He killed William Henshaw, a store clerk, who made a pass at a young woman he'd laid claim to. Though Henshaw's murder took place in front of dozens of witnesses, and Henshaw himself lived just long enough to ID his killer, the collective amnesia of the witnesses was something to behold, and Madden walked away without conviction. Following his release, the Gopher Gang upped their violence game, taking over the protection rackets in other neighborhoods and rubbing out rival street gangs. This was hardly one-way traffic. The Hudson Dusters were a rival gang, formed by an ex-Gopher Gang member named Gugu Knox. On November 6, 1914, the Hudson Dusters ambushed several Gopher Gang members outside the Arbor Dance Hall. Three Gophers were killed, and Madden was shot anywhere between 6 and 11 times, depending on whose recollection you read. Madden survived the shooting and sought revenge, which led to a 20-year sentence at Sing Sing Prison before the year was out. By the end of 1914, both gangs would be disbanded in a wave of murders, drug overdoses, and incarcerations. When released in 1923, Oni found a different world waiting for him. Shaking down shopkeepers for protection money was so yesterday. The 1920s were all about bootlegging. Now, as I stated in what was the main episode when this first came out, the following will be a little bit meta. On January 16th, 1919, partly on the belief that such a law would help reduce poverty, and largely through the rallying of several religious institutions, American politicians ratified the 18th Amendment, effectively banning the production, importation, transportation, 
in sale of alcohol in the country. The National Prohibition Act, better known as the Volstead Act, was written into law in October 1919, giving law enforcement authority to enforce the liquor ban. As America thirsted for drink, and many otherwise law-abiding Americans recognized this legislation was idiotic, organized criminal gangs suddenly had a large market to cater to at considerably less risk than other legal activities. Madden soon found employment as hired muscle for a bootlegger named Larry Fay. He arranged the import of whiskey from Canada, smuggled in the boots of American taxi cabs. Having learned the ropes, Madden set up a rival operation. Big Bill Dwyer was another rival bootlegger, who had several shipments hijacked from under his nose. Dwyer was then made an offer he could not refuse by Madden to just hand his whole business over, which he did. Madden soon turned profits into ownership of several speakeasies, most notably the Cotton Club. In 1920, the former world heavyweight boxing champion, Jack Johnson, opened a supper club on the corner of 142nd Street and Lenox Avenue in Harlem. Johnson struggled to keep the club open during Prohibition and turned to Madden for a quick sale. Johnson remained, nominally, the owner of the rebranded Cotton Club, which took off under the guidance of the mobster. Though a largely segregated club, open to white patrons only, many of the greatest black performers of the era played there, from band leaders like Duke Ellington, Fletcher Henderson and Chick Webb, to featured singers and dancers like Cab Calloway, Louis Armstrong, Lena Horne, the Mills Brothers, Billie Holiday, Bessie Smith, the Nicholas Brothers and the Dandridge Sisters. The Cotton Club was well up there with the Savoy Ballroom as the hot tickets in town. It was always full of celebrities, had a fantastic range of alcohol available, and some of the greatest swing music ever. It was here that Madden met, and for a while dated, Mae West. He'd fund a first play, Six, in 1927, when nobody else would. She later commented only was sweet, but oh so vicious. He also took George Raft on as a driver. The stylish Raft would leverage his friendship with Madden to launch a career as a Hollywood actor. By 1931, Madden had become extremely rich out of bootlegging and various other criminal activities. After a brief stint back inside in 1932, he'd caught the attention of authorities after putting a $50,000 price on the head of a gangster and child killer called Vincent Mad Dog Cole. But he'd gone away after a minor parole violation. He turned his hand to promoting boxing matches. On June 14th, 1934, Max Bayer, a boxer of some renown, later the father of Max Bayer Jr., Jeffro in the TV show Beverly Hillbillies, faced off against Primo Carnera, a two-meter-tall monster named the Ambling Alp. The fight was suspiciously one-sided, with Bayer knocking Carnera down 11 times in 11 rounds. It's been long speculated Madden fixed the bout to maximize gambling profits. The mid-1930s were a time of relative peace. The Castellamarese War of 1930-31 led to mafiosi setting up a commission, which ensured some peace and stability, but Madden knew it wouldn't last. The mafia was soon likely to muscle the likes of himself out of the market. He was feeling a little old and suffered aches from his many gunshot wounds. Possibly with the blessing of Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello, he closed shop and retired to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Some point out he may have been sent there by the mob to set up a gambling house. It is noticeable soon after moving to town, Madden paid for a wire service to be laid in the town, allowing bookies to get the horse racing results. Whatever the case, he arrived in town and sought out hydro treatment for his gunshot wounds. He met and fell in love with Agnes Demby, 
who almost certainly knew of her husband's past life. Beneath the surface, Hot Springs was a corrupt place, with its fair share of illegal gambling and prostitution. Their mayor, Leo P. McLaughlin, was later found to be controlling much of the trade. For 30 years, Madden, at the very least, gave the impression of living the life of a modest, legitimate businessman. His bar, the Southern Club, did well. Whether gone legit or not, he had many visits over the years from Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, Maya Lansky and Joe Adonis. But on the flip side, this Oni Madden was no longer a man of violence. He lived in a modest house with his wife. He was active in the community and supported a number of local charities. He was a well-known and well-liked figure, often seen round town, trademark fedora hat of a gangster, replaced by the big, slouchy cap of the country gentleman. Whether completely clean or not, he was a remarkable figure for having gone into an idyllic semi-retirement where most of his contemporaries were either jailed or murdered. 